Greetings, my name is Alan Lewis, and I am Dean and Professor here at the School of Health Professions at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University. Welcome to our segment today. Our topic will be disability and older adults. So just as an overview, to give you a little bit of a preview of what we'll be covering in our conversation today, we're gonna to do a bit of an introduction, and then we're gonna talk about Disability 101, that's the basics of disability. We'll talk about some interventions for disability. We'll talk about Aging 101, again, the basics of aging. We'll talk about the intersection of both disability and the aging process. We'll then address challenges in attempting to improve function. We'll talk about participation and quality of life. Then we'll talk about services and supports. And then we'll end our time together talking about legal implications, risk management, and financial considerations. So let's shove off and get going. In the way of an introduction, so this topic is very timely in 2021 and beyond due to the greater recognition of disability as well as longer life expectancy. Both of these statuses of disability and aging produce challenges in function. What we're gonna to do today is really examine the intersection between these two statuses and the resulting functional limitations and therefore its impact on quality of life. Now, the basics of disability, I call this Disability 101. So within disability, within the disability world, there are at least three definitions that you can commonly see. The first one is the definition that we get from the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it really is more of a legal concept. And it really is used typically in situations when one is uh, alleging discrimination based on disability. And the ADA definition of disability basically says that a person is, disab is disabled when she or he has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more life areas and that person has a record of that impairment and is regarded as such. That's the Americans with Disabilities Act legal definition of disability. We also have a definition of disability that comes from the Social Security Administration that's used in determinations about whether or not people will receive uh, Social Security Disability Income or Supplemental Security Income, SSDI or SSI. And that definition says that a disability is when one has the inability to engage in substantial gainful activity due to a physical or mental impairment that can result in death or is expected to last for at least 12 continuous months. The final definition of disability we'll, con we'll consider today is the one by the World Health Organization, and it's called the International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health. It's a framework that really speaks to functioning as a complex interplay of five factors. Health condition, that is, what is the health malady or abnormality that causes the disability? What's the level of impairment? In other words, what's the functional limitation? What does the resulting participation um, end up being, what's the environmental concerns, and what is the coping. So the WHO definition, or the World Health Organization definition, that concept of disability is much more holistic and function-based. And optimal participation within that definition is the goal, and participation is often a proxy variable or a correlate that gets measured to actually approximate quality of life. Continuing with our overview of disability and the basics, uh, there's a difference between the concepts of disability and health condition that often folks are not clear on. Now, all disabilities involve a health condition, that is a malady or abnormality. However, all health conditions do not constitute a disability, but some can. Health conditions don't rise to the level of being a disability unless they produce a major functional limitation that's non-curable and permanent. So if you have a health condition that does impact a major life area, and has a really severe functional impairment um, and it's non-curable and it's permanent, then it can be considered to be a disability, but not all health conditions are that way. So not all health conditions constitute a disability, but clearly all disabilities involve some health condition or some health abnormality or malady that constitutes the need for uh, that person to have some functional adjustment in their life. Okay. Categories of disability. Now, disability can occur both in the process of uh, the gestational process when the person is in that nine months forming as an infant, as a fetus. Uh, it can happen during the birthing process, and also it can happen after the person is born in some type of life event, accident, or something like that that's typically trauma-induced. So you can have both an innate or an acquired disability. Within that broad context, there are at least six different categories. There are six categories of disability that we typically consider. The first category is psychiatric disability. This includes thought and emotional disorders. 
It involves problems with brain chemistry. It typically involves mental illness and things like schizophrenia, uh, where we have problems in the chemistry of the brain in terms of the dopamine uh, transmission and the receptors. So that's a psychiatric disability and mental illness. We also have a category of disabilities called developmental disabilities. These disabilities are interruptions in the normal development. Uh, so these can manifest themselves as, say, an intellectual disability or an autism spectrum disorder, disorder or a neurological disability. Uh, these usually result from something that happens in the process of the person gestationally in that, in that period of time or in the birthing process uh, to interrupt the normal development. We call that a developmental disability. There are also sensory disabilities, and these involve difficulty in perceiving the world through senses, uh, through vision and hearing, and so it can include partial um, blindness or, or complete blindness or partial hearing impairment or complete hearing impairment. Uh, there are cognitive disabilities, which is the fourth category, which involves a flaw in thinking and executive, executive functioning, which typically occurs in situations where the person has a traumatic brain injury, which is really a trauma-induced event that injures the brain and modifies the function, that is, limits the functioning in terms of that thinking and executive ability of the individual. There are also mobility disabilities, and these disabilities involve difficulties in getting around, in ambulation. Uh, and these typically occur with spinal cord injuries, where persons have uh, sustained an injury and they're no longer able to walk uh, and require the usage of a, of a wheelchair or some type of device to actually ambulate. And then there are physical disabilities, and these disabilities involve abnormal appearance of some sort, either an anatomical structure in the case of an amputee or an amputation, or in the case of a severe burn. So those are the six major categories of disability, psychiatric, developmental, sensory, cognitive, mobility, and physical. Continuing with our disability 101 concept, typically what you see is the existence of more than one disability. It's not an unusual occurrence in individuals. Uh, I used to work in mental health way back in the 1980s in a, in a city, urban setting. And at that point in time, we sort of had this myth in our minds that when you came in for, for treatment uh, for disability or rehabilitation for disability, you had to choose what your primary um, issue was because the, the assumption was that only one was really the issue. Uh, but now we know that individuals typically have more than one challenge. So many have a, 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 a disability such as a spinal cord injury or head injury, and they may also have high blood pressure or diabetes or some other severe chronic medical impairment, or it could be a person who has a psychiatric uh, issue in terms of mental illness and also has a, an addiction problem. So comorbidities or more than one disability occurring in the same person are pretty common. Um, and so uh, that's the reality to, in today's, today's world, that we actually recognize more than one disability um, when that actually occurs, where heretofore, uh, historically, we weren't quite as a student doing that. But multiple impairments or comorbid disabilities uh, or a disability and a health condition are pretty common. Now, interventions for disability. So the process that we use to, intervention to uh, intervene when a person has a disability is considered to be rehabilitation. The process is designed to address disability and mitigate the negative functional impact that that disability poses on that individual. Rehabilitation incorporates two main strategies. The first strategy is a change in the individual's function, and we call that restoration, where the locus of intervention is actually on the person to try to modify something about the person's being uh, to make that person able to function at a higher level in the face of that disability. That's not always possible. You can't always restore that functioning in the person, particularly, for example, in a high cervical um, injury in a spinal cord. Let's say a, uh, cervical one or cervical two injury where the person is, has a very high injury and you're not going to, at this point, the, the science doesn't allow us to completely uh, fix that in terms of restoring that function. So the best thing you can do is adaptation, which is the second modification, which is the second intervention uh, strategy within rehabilitation, where you actually modify the environment. You modify the context that the person functions in so that the, um, the, the functional uh, limitation is not as severe. You sort of level the playing field by making adjustments in the environmental context uh, through using assist assistive technology and various other devices. Um, then we call that adaptation. So we have to either restore the person to the extent that you can, or you can adapt the environment um, to make sure that that uh, functional issue is mitigated to the extent as po it can possibly be minimized. Now let's move on to aging. Aging 101, the basics of the aging process. So advancing age generally means a decreasing amount of time to live versus time already lived. Using myself as an example, I'm now, I've just begun my sixth decade of living, 
And, uh, and I'm fully aware that it's highly unlikely that I'm going to live six more decades. So I've already reached a point in my life where I know that more life is behind me than I have to, to, to live ahead of me. Uh, so that's a common um, attribute for people of, of advancing age. Uh, there's also the issue of decline in mental and physical capacity. Uh, even though I'm in you know, pretty good shape, I think, and I'm pretty still somewhat astute mentally, I'm not the person I used to be. I can see how, the, how things have changed as I've gotten a little bit older. Um, you also have increasing incidence or susceptibility to chronic medical conditions and their negative effects. Um, the older you get, the more likely you are to have um, these chronic medical conditions and you're more susceptible to their deleterious effects. As an older person, you have increased incidence of falls and other accidents that can result in injury, disability, or death. And you also have a situation where your peer supports, your familial supports and your friends and your network of, of contacts around you begins to decrease. Because as you age, uh, you notice that more and more people that are in your, in your age category are dying as you move forward. So you have a decreasing um, uh, set of peers that can support you going forward. Now let's talk a little bit about the intersection of disability and aging. So disability can certainly exacerbate or make worse the aging process, and aging can certainly make worse or exacerbate the impact of disability. So both aging and disability have what we call a reciprocal negative impact. They both negatively impact the other. Some differential diagnosis in terms of what the, which of these areas, disability or aging, is actually causing the, uh, the negative impact can be tricky, and in, in many cases, not all that important. Uh, because we know that uh, disability and aging both can pose functional limitations and together they give you that synergistic negative impact, not just additive but geometric impact uh, in terms of those two pieces working together in a way to bring you, uh, to bring into, the, into focus more limitations functionally. And we know that quality of life is likely to be more compromised when one experiences both disability and aging concurrently. Um, so as you go forward, uh, and you age and you have a disability, your quality of life has a higher probability of diminishing over time. So, challenges in attempting to improve function. Uh, and this is improvements in function both in terms of being disabled and aging. So, going back to our uh, original slide where we talked about restoration and adaptation. Remember, restoration is a process of interve intervening with a person to mitigate the negative impact of disability and its concurrent functional limitations by by uh, having those interventions address the locus of, of uh, the location of the person, restoring the person's body in some way to improve their functioning. Now, in order for that to happen in an aging person, it requires a certain degree of resilience and or residual functioning in the individual, which is not always present in older adult. So if you're gonna restore my body to its original capacity because I'm at diminished capacity because of a disability, and now I'm much older, it's not always possible for me to have that residual um, uh, room to, neg to negotiate and improve my functioning in a restorative kind of way. So it's, it can be a challenge in terms of restoration. In terms of adaptation, it's the process, you will call, of intervening with the environment to mitigate the negative impact on disability associated with functional limitations by modifying, modifying and changing uh, the actual context, con mm, context or environment or the milieu that, we're, that the person's functioning in. It typically includes adding assistive technology. The, here, it requires there to be a certain amount of flexibility and adaptation, willingness and motivation, and capacity to learn to navigate changes in the context that persons who are older are not always willing to do or have the wherewithal to do. It may involve learning a new technology or learning how to use a new device or tool to mitigate that negative functioning in an environmental kind of way. And as you get older, you have less resilience in your learning capacity and your motivation to try new things, typically speaking. Not always, but typically speaking. So in attempting to improve function in a person who's both disabled and aging, the restoration process and the adaptation process, both of those can be somewhat challenging because the person doesn't always have the residual functioning, the motivation, and the wherewithal to make the adjustments needed with both restoration and adaptation. In situations where there are comorbid disabilities, in an elderly individual, um, and the multifaceted attribute of impairment along with an ongoing age-related challenge can result in significant functional deficits or deficiencies. Uh, so recognition of the various challenges is the first step. When you have a person who has got multiple issues, multiple types of disadvantage from both aging and disability, uh, then you've got to understand um, what the uh, various challenges are as the first step. And then you've got to intervene in a way to enhance function 
and that requires using typically a multi-pronged set of strategies, which typically means often use, using an interprofessional team of clinicians, which means you not only have a, a physician involved, you may also have an occupational therapist or a rehabilitation counselor or a rehabilitation engineer or a social worker or a case manager or whoever, um, but it's usually a team of clinicians all coming from different professional backgrounds coming together to actually uh, put together a game plan to help mitigate the negative impact of disability and aging when they come together in the same person, when they co-occur, when they're concomitant. Participation and quality of life. So, a desirable quality of life is the goal for most people. The World Health Organization's uh, International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health Framework, which is, defines what a disability is, states that the degree of an individual's disability is very individualized and depends on that complex interaction between the health condition, that is, what's causing the disability, the functional impairment, and in other words, the limitation, that person's ability to participate in the face of that, in, in the face of that limitation, what the environment has to offer, and how well that person is coping. So an individual's disability is very individualized, and it depends on each person's situation in terms of what that health condition is, what the extent of functional limitation is, that is the impairment, how much that person can participate, what the environment offers in the way of enhancements or challenges, and what the coping actually is. But overall, participation is the key. There's a direct correlation between a person's ability to function well enough to participate in those activities that she or he prefers and the actual involvement. Uh, so the, the ability to participate and actually being involved, actually participating, are directly correlated, which is a, sort of an obvious point. And when that happens, when you can do both, that equates to a desirable quality of life. So the extent of full participation that is possible um, matters, as does the degree to which one can participate with some independence. And that participation, the extent to which it can be somewhat independent or semi-independent is typically the extent to which the person feels like she has a higher quality of life. An individual who is elderly and who also has a disability may have a confluence of limitations from both of these statuses working against full independent functioning. And therefore, the potential to compromise quality of life when both of these statuses, uh, these statuses co-occur is, is, uh, is there, clearly there. Services and supports. So a person who has a disability and also uh, is an older adult clearly has a need for services and supports. Um, and so there are sort of a multitude of, of services and supports that can be offered, and many of them will be needed. Obviously, case management and care coordination will be a key um, service, and that really involves having a point person who coordinates uh, the many providers who may be on the team providing various aspects of care uh, and, 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 um, and rehabilitation to this person who is disabled and also elderly. That involves, you know, linking, triaging, um, brokering services, uh, advocating for the person, all those kind of things that go into coordinating and managing a case. Uh, so case management and care coordination is very important and it's sort of a central piece to the whole array of services and supports. There's also counseling. Um, many times people who are disabled and elderly have some uh, adjustment issues, life adjustment issues that require some type of counseling intervention to uh, help them feel better about it, you know, psychologically. Uh, there's also the need for medical support, obviously. Uh, rehabilitation, whether it be uh, restoration or adaptation or a combination of those two. Um, there's also the need for in-home daily su living support. Uh, which typically comes from a caregiver, somebody who comes in and helps with activities of daily living, you know, meal preparation, uh, self-care and hygiene, um, getting around, you know, whatever the person wants to be in engaged in in the home setting, that's the sort of the, at, the, um, the activities that that person would like to engage in, sort of as a leisure kind of undertaking. Uh, income support, you know, obviously a lot of folks have needs for supplemental income. To, uh, to pay for these services and to make sure that their quality of life has the opportunity to be maximized and optimized. Housing support, uh, making sure that the housing situation is stable and appropriate for the person's functional limitations and psychosocial support, which really speaks to the ability of the person to have some interaction with others, have some socialization, and have some psychological well-being in that social context. Uh, so these are the types of services and supports that typically are needed for persons with disability, as well as persons who are older, and certainly when people have both concom um, concomitant uh, statuses, they certainly will need this array of services and supports. Legal implications, risk management, and financial considerations. So there's a lot on this slide, and you see I've kind of got it co color-coded. 
So legal implications. So the first thing that we have to think about is mental status. Um, oftentimes a person with a disability who's also um, an aging adult who's older uh, will have some challenges with, with mental status and they will not always necessarily be oriented to person, place, and time um, consistently. Uh, so you have to make sure that you um, have the ability to understand what that person's mental capacity is in terms of knowing who they are, where they are, and what time it is, and what century it is, you know, what year it is, those types of things. Uh, then competency. Competency speaks to the person's ability to, to understand what's in her or his best interest and to be able to make a decision that aligns with her or his best interest. So there are two aspects of competency. The, the person being able to understand exactly what's in her or his best interest and then being able to make a decision that's aligned with her or his best interest. So that sometimes diminishes as well when a person has a disability and is an older adult. And so sometimes when that happens, there needs to be um, the assignment of guardianship, somebody who is a legal guardian uh, or a guardian uh, ad litem who comes into the picture, who actually uh, helps make decisions for that person, that person's best interest when that, comp when that competency is not always what it needs to be. Then there's the concept of living will, which really speaks to those end of life issues when a person is, is sort of winding down their life and, and there are questions about what needs to be done um, in terms of saving this person's life. Does this person want heroic measures um, taken in terms of resuscitating to keep that person alive? So the living will addresses all the kinds of uh, possible scenarios that can happen when a person is ending uh, his or her life and what that person will, would like to have happen to save their life or prolong their life or, or maybe not save or prolong their life. So the living will addresses those things. So it's a will that speaks to the end of life issues. The person's still alive. Then you have the last will and testament. Obviously the person has moved on, has, has deceased, and this speaks to what happens to the person's estate and the assets the person has if, uh, and, and who will get those things and what, what, what happens to sort of close down, close up the, uh, close the loop in terms of um, this person's life and this person's um, possessions. Moving on to risk management. So risk management is really the process of trying to uh, mitigate risk and be proactive and stay ahead of risk as much as possible. Uh, we want to have proactive medical screenings for health risk. And uh, so that means that you want to make sure that you stay on top of all the uh, screenings that are available to ensure that uh, further health conditions or further things that can impact uh, functioning uh, can be averted in a preemptive kind of way as, as quickly as possible and as much as possible. Um, so those, uh, you know, screenings for like, you know, colonoscopies and pro uh, PSAs for prostate cancer, those types of things to make sure that we stay ahead of these health risks that can, that can occur and when they come into the picture can further complicate the functional uh, scenario this person's dealing with. We want to mitigate that as much as possible. Uh, proactive environmental screenings for fall risk. We know that persons who are disabled and who are older uh, have a higher propensity to fall. So we want to make sure that the environment that that person is negotiating on a daily basis is as free from fall risk as possible. Um, that somebody goes in and looks at the environment and makes sure that things that are obvious risk are eliminated and removed to minimize the opportunity for this person to have a fall. Because we know that falls on a person who's already disabled and is elderly can really severely impact their functioning in a much more negative way than it already would be prior to that fall. Environmental combinations. You know, sometimes there need to be things that, that are done to the environment in the way of adaptation Remember that rehab concept of adaptation that make the environment more minimal uh, to that person having a, uh, the ability to function optimally and have a higher quality of life. Those would be things like maybe installing a lift uh, to go upstairs or a ramp for a wheelchair user, you know, and other types of assistive technology and devices that can be added to an environmental context to make that living situation much more suitable and friendly to that person who's got those functional limitations from both disability and the aging process. Finally, we talk about financial considerations. These are three concepts I want to talk about that are, that are not as commonplace as you might think. Long-term care. Long-term care is a type of insurance um, that really speaks to providing the care that a person needs when a person is at the end of life and they're um, really decreased in their functioning. So it involves um, basically paying an insurance premium that really allows that person to have the wherewithal to, to bring in the support they need um, for uh, to support them in their home or to go live in a specialized living arrangement uh, and have all that be paid for. Long-term care is really designed for people who have assets that they want to protect and they don't want to have be expended with their end-of-life um, expenses. So long-term care is a type of insurance that you would purchase that would allow those end-of-life expenses to be covered by that insurance um, by that insurance um, 
provider, a third party provider. Um, if, if you don't have any assets, long term care is not typically uh, a good investment of money. Uh, if you have, you know, uh, a home or homes or um, insurance policies that you want to pass on to your dependents and, and your children and grandkids, then long term care is a great asset uh, because then it protects those, those, um, those things that you have, those resources, from being used up and spun down essentially when you have to go into a nursing home or an adult care facility or have to bring in extra supports to, to allow you to live in your natural in-home environment. Uh, viatical settlements. Viatical, se viatical settlements is a type of uh, insurance. So basically what a viatical, viatical settlement is, it's an instrument, um, a vehicle I should say, that allows one to have, if you already have an insurance policy, whether it be a universal term or a whole life policy, that has a particular death benefit. Now all insurance policies have a death benefit, which is the amount of money, lump sum money, that gets paid to the beneficiary on the death of the person who's insured, at death of the person who's insured. So a viatical settlement says, okay, I have this insurance policy, I have this $100,000 uh, death benefit for my insurance policy, but I'm now at a point still living, but diminishing in my function because of disability and aging, that I really need the cash some cash now to supplement my end of life supports, my in-home supports, my medical screenings, and all the things that support my quality of life as my life is ending. So instead of waiting for me to die as the insured person and then paying that lump sum death benefit to my beneficiaries or beneficiary, a viatical segment lets you go to the insurance company and say, look, here's my situation. I need the cash now. Let me take a portion of my death benefit and liquidate that as assets right now that I can use to live on. So if I have $100,000 in, in life insurance death benefit, I can go in with, to the insurance company and say, I need $50,000 now because my life expectancy is five more years and I have you know $10,000 in expenses per year that I need to pay for. The insurance company will then typically say, okay, fine, we'll give you the $50,000, but it just lowers your death benefit from $100,000 to $50,000. For many people, that's a great trade-off because it gives them the cash they need immediately for the end-of-life expenses rather than having the death benefit be what it was originally in the policy and then somebody benefits from that as in the, as i.e. the beneficiary down the road. Um, and then, so it's a good source of cash if you have the policy. And then reverse mortgages. Many folks have heard of these. Reverse mortgages uh, aren't, you can only get one of those if you're 65 years of age or older. And really what it is, if you have a mortgage and you paid into your mortgage over the years, a mortgage on your home, that is, and you have a certain amount of equity, the reverse mortgage allows you to basically freeze things and take the equity out of the home that you already paid in if you need that for living expenses, for cash now, uh, liquidate that equity, and still stay in your home for the rest of your life. The only, the only hitch is, is that when you, di when you die, the home goes to the company that did the reverse mortgage. But it's a great option for, for, for a person who doesn't have a lot of cash but has a home has, a, has some equity in the home, and they're at the end of their life, and they need, their, they need to be to put their hands on some ready-made cash for the last few years of their life. And so they basically borrow against, or basically take the, the um, equity from their, from their mortgage, use that as cash now for the end of life expenses. It, you don't have to leave your home. You get to live in your house until you die. But at the point that you do die, the, the house then is, belongs to the, to the company that gave the re reverse mortgage, unless somebody in your family steps up and takes on that mortgage and does the refinancing. So again, um, both viatical settlements and reverse mortgages are ways that you can use an existing life insurance policy or a mortgage that you paid into to get some cash out of those, e either one of those two vehicles to use to supplement your end of life expenses going forward um, if needed, if needed. So that pretty much concludes our time. I would like to say that uh, I do appreciate your attention um, in our segment and uh, obviously the goal for this population of persons who are aging and disabled is to optimize function, which leads to increased participation, which leads to increased quality of life, and that is the goal. So as you go forward, you may have questions. We'll be available to actually help you address those questions. Thank you again and best wishes.